tensions on the Korean peninsula are making international headlines amid a series of recent missile launches by Pyongyang, including earlier on this Monday in response to the planned tabletop exercise by Seoul and Washington later this week at the Pentagon. So what has been the focus of all related coverage? What are the broader implications of Seoul's latest defence white paper? And what other stories have been on the foreign media over the past week? Welcome to Issues and Insiders. It's Monday and time for a check on stories here that made headlines elsewhere as well. For that, I have Sebastian Filetti here in the studio with me. Sebastian, it's been a while. Welcome back. Yeah, thank you very much. I also have Melanie Jensen with us. Melanie, it's good to see you again. It's good to see you too. Right, Sebastian, let's begin with foreign media coverage of tensions here on the Korean Peninsula, especially ahead of a planned tabletop exercise between Seoul and Washington at the Pentagon later this week. And of course, the two ballistic missile launches by Pyongyang earlier on this mm -hmm. Monday morning. Mm -hmm. As least, as usual, usually when spring is looming, there's always a regain of tension with this exercise. But it seems like uh, this year it's uh, getting more serious earlier. Uh, we saw this ballistic launch uh, this weekend, but we saw also a quick re response from the U.S. Uh, Rock Alliance with the deployment of some uh, bomber, strategic bombers. That was clearly a signal from Washington that to North Korea that they will not tolerate our escalation. And of course, this is a worrying trend because we're seeing that on both sides, people are digging in. Of course, North Korea has showed his uh, intention over the last year with numerous missile tests, but also the last few weeks with military parade, with declaration from Kim Jong-un that they definitely want to develop on an exponential scale their, their arsenal. And we can see in Seoul, as a, from the government in Seoul, as a, as a determination to show that they will not tolerate that. And of course, you have the US on the top who needs to respond to that, but also accommodate its own ally, South Korea, reassure its own ally that the nuclear umbrella is sufficient. And this is also what is looming behind this whole discussion, is like to what extent Seoul is fully uh, reassured by the, 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 the U.S. alliance uh, in the face of potential future uh, nuclear tactical weapon from, from, from North Korea. Right. And staying with inter-Korean matters, Melania, there was also a bit of coverage about the UN administration's latest defense white paper labeling the Kim Jong-un regime as an enemy. Do tell us a bit about that particular coverage and also about the broader implications. Yes, so um, this, has, uh, this paper has received uh, quite huge coverage uh, in the US um, and I think uh, the reason for this is the very uh, confrontal language that the, uh, the um, Korean Defense Minister is using in this uh, white paper. For the first time in six years, uh, the Kim Jong-un regime has been labelled an enemy and at the same time it has referred to Kim Jong-un without his usual title, which is uh, Chairman um, Kim Jong-un. So uh, this shows uh, the very um, strict policy that Yun Seok Yul is right now trying to, um, to uh, implement over North Korea. And it might be um, a symbol that he is trying to um, get a closer tie with the US and with Japan. And that is one of the reasons why he's being so harsh towards uh, North Korea. Right, and beyond cross-border affairs, Sebastian, Seoul's efforts to settle the issue of compensation for its victims of forced wartime labor under Japanese colonial rule, of course, was dealt with by the French media, I believe. Could you tell us a bit about that particular coverage? Yeah, there was a story about from a RFI radio on this. Of course, this is a long-standing issue. It's nothing really new for between South Korea and Seoul. There's, is, we know that it's a long uh, diplomatic uh, uh, irritant between Tokyo and Seoul. So uh, there's this uh, discussion going on also because we are in a different context now. We are in a context where the two sides are trying with the new administration in South Korea. They're trying to warm up their ties. Also, this is a push from, from Washington also behind. So, of course, this report was about trying to explain also to a European readership what it entails, because of course, for European readers, this is 
still quite complex, but they're also fascinated by history. This is really rooted in the history of the North, the Northeast Asia in the current peninsula. You need to explain to your readers, uh, uh, as we have to do in, in Europe, and as man is doing too, is like, you have to give context, you have to explain where this is coming from, why there's so much sensitivity still in Korea about uh, Japanese colonization. So this topic is really fascinating beyond the, just the news, it's about also explaining uh, what what's behind and also the diplomatic uh, game because it's also part of a bigger game uh, uh, between governments. Right, of course. Melanie, what stories related to Korea made Danish headlines this past week? Well, as always, uh, North Korean uh, news is a big uh, hit, I would say, in, in Danish uh, papers. So. Uh, most of the big uh, national Danish newspapers have reported about the ballistic missile that North Korea fired uh, last Saturday. But more interestingly, I would say, there is uh, what I think is a Denmark exclusive story about Korea. Uh, we had um, a big Danish uh, national song contest uh, where we found the, the winner for wh who, will, um, who will participate in a Euro European bigger song contest. But anyway, uh, that winner uh, is um, a Danish citizen who very much uh, resembles uh, a K-pop star. And that is um, very unusual from what we see in Denmark, where uh, artists are trying to be a bit more laid back um, and not so uh, uh, bubblegum colored as, as we see in K-pop. But um, this particular singer called Rayleigh has a very big fan um, base in South Korea. He has been traveling to the country, has held concerts there. And, and now he actually won the Danish um, song competition, so he will soon be competing uh, in Liverpool against um, all uh, European nations in the song competition with a song that is also very much K-pop inspired as well as choreography that is K-pop inspired. That is very interesting, I see. Yes. Uh, meanwhile, on a more somber note, uh, Melanie, two Russians who had been stranded at Incheon International Airport were recently granted the right to apply for refugee status here in the country. Could you tell us a bit about their plight? Yes, um, so we have right now uh, five men who has been stranded in Incheon Airport um, since fall last year. And now two of them um, has uh, gotten refugee status after they for several months have fought the Korean government uh, to get this status. Um, and it has, uh, it has been difficult because uh, the men, all five of them, have escaped Russia to uh, Korea because they have been trying to avoid the military service. And Korea actually don't give a refugee status to people um, when they try to escape military service, uh, which might be because of their own uh, service in the country. Um, however, uh, two of these men have now won the right to get a refugee status. When they will get it, though, is still not certain, as this can take several years. Um, another of the, the five men, he actually got denied his, um, his status, and he will probably now uh, make an appeal and the remaining two are still waiting to get the judged verdict. Right, I see. Moving forward, Sebastian, there was also a bit of coverage about South Korea's aid of one million US dollars, if I'm right, for Syria in light of the recent earthquake there. Could you tell us a bit about that? Well, I mean, it's just an attempt from, uh, I mean, it was a random news, I think, from news agency, but basically South Korea is also interested in trying to play a bigger role as an international uh, aid uh, donor and also in the earthquake that happened in Turkey is extremely of a massive scale and uh, it's also interesting to see how Korea is trying to also be part of that, um, try to help in that story. Uh, so I mean in this report was coming from a, a, from a Turkish news agency, of course for them it's a big relief to have all this country going around. And we know that this kind of a uh, tragedy is also a moment of diplomacy. It's also a moment where we can bring the focus on one country. And uh, of course, the, the international uh, vision on this matters too. But, um, of course, it's of little relief for the people <laughs> there who have been hurt. Uh, of course. Um, Moving on to the social front, Melanie, Reuters also covered the subway, the free subway rides for senior citizens here in capital Seoul, claiming that the silver benefit has become, quote, a political headache. Could you explain this for us? 
Yes, uh, so for four decades, a Korean senior citizens aged uh, 60, uh, 65 and above, they have been able to ride the subway for free. And this kind of um, free access to public transportation has been credited with keeping the seniors active in Korea. Um, however, now as the Korean population is rapidly uh, aging, it is actually becoming a little bit of a problem that such a big part of the Korean population can access the subway for free, especially because uh, the government is not really uh, paying anything um, to, uh, to keep this benefit. Uh, for that reason, many uh, subway companies in Korea are um, trying to push the government to make them pay at least a part of, um, of this um, big bill of seniors um, just travelling um, across the city for free. Mm. How does such benefits, silver benefits so to speak, compare with some of the benefits that you might have over in your country? Well, uh, in Denmark, uh, senior citizens, they do pay for, uh, for the subway. Um, however, they, d they do get these kind of senior discounts. But in Denmark, uh, it's been, um, we're, we're already moving uh, on and like slowly raising the age for when we actually label people seniors. Um, meaning that, first of all, uh, people retire later, they work longer. Um, and then when they get the benefits, uh, I would say it's not as much uh, a free subway ride as it is uh, a higher pension. Um, so they get more money instead of these kind of perks. I see. Sebastian, on a light note, Agence France Presse had a rather intriguing article about Korea's love of iced Americano. Do you give us the gist of that coverage? And personally, what are your thoughts on Korea's passion for iced Americanos, even during the brutal winter? Well, I think for the story was a very interesting story. They interview people, especially young people. That we know that ice Americano is such a popular drink, and especially now in winter, it's always striking, especially for foreign audience, how you want to drink so much ice uh, liquid uh, in such a winter season. But uh, I, I think it's a fascinating story. Uh, I mean, I, I've always been fascinated by the, the fact that Koreans love ice stuff, not just in winter, even in summer, they always want ice and I'm always curious where it's coming from. I mean, is there some history? Because, you know, traditional medicine also usually say recommend warm water. That's why in China people drink mainly warm water. Uh, having said that, there are some o o occasion where it might be good to uh, get, like you have cold namyon, you know, it can sometimes help in some circumstances. But I'm really curious about why Corona is so obsessed with ice. I don't know if there is also here, uh, I wonder if there's an American influence in the post-war era when you had all the GIs who bring ice was a very American thing, you know. But this is just a hypothesis. I think historian and sociologists should read really into it. deserve more than just a, a newspaper article because is it something uh, from the modern era, just from the post-war era or is it something that comes deeper in the traditional roots uh, of Korea? I don't know if you have any thought on this. I don't have a, <laughs> an idea on that though. But, but I you was like Americana? Yeah. I actually uh, do my, like iced Americana. Okay. Do you like? You've been here for uh, quite yeah, a while. Yeah, actually I, I, I'm, I prefer warm, maybe because I spent some time in China, but I, in summer this is the country Korea where I start to indulge into ice Americano, but maybe I like like ice flat white or ice with a little ice latte, maybe a little bit more. I but see. But in, in the hot summer in July, I, I, I you got find the yourself taste. drinking an yeah. ice Americano. And this is that happened in Korea for the right, first time. So now see. it's one of my discovery here. <laughs> right, Melania, how do you like your coffee? <laughs> well, I really like ice Americano actually. Okay, that's um, good to not know. Not so much in the winter though. <laughs> right. Okay, right. This is the real right. thing of a new generation right, right a new generation here so born right here in so Korea old school, you know <laughs> Melanie on a solemn note the BBC it did a piece on Seoul's plans to remove women only parking spots which was put into uh, practice over a decade ago to ensure their safety what was the story of that particular what was the focus of that particular story and how do you respond to this reversal in policy 
Well, uh, first of all, uh, the women-only parking spots, they will be uh, remade into uh, family-only parking spots. And I think it's very important to understand the background of why these uh, parking spots were actually made. They were made because women were feeling unsafe, uh, because studies actually showed that many of the, the crimes committed in basements where these parking lots usually are, uh, were um, sexual assaults uh, towards women or any kind of like sexual crime, like catcalling, making women feel unsafe. Um, however, now um, the Korean government has decided to remove them and this has really not um, been responded well to by the BBC who did the story. And I think it's because uh, right now, um, ever since Chun suk yul took place, uh, he has been labelled uh, the anti-feminist president. So I think whenever he does these kind of uh, policies, which can be viewed as being anti-feministic or can be as like um, a setback for women or women's rights or uh, women's privileges or women's perks. Um, it will be received in the, the West at least as some kind of uh, anti-feminist agenda. Um, and that is also how this story was, was focused. Right, and that was how the story was f uh, focused on by the BBC, of course. Sebastian, speaking within your capacity as a French journalist whose capital city is known to be the mecca of fashion, what is your answer to American magazine Vogue's question, how did Seoul become pop culture's new frontier? Well, I mean, if Vogue says it, it must be true, but uh, okay. we can see it every day. I mean, we experience that every day that... Uh, I think the interest for Seoul, Seoul as a cool city, is uh, is um, almost evident every day. I can see through my interaction with uh, people in France, in back in Europe, the interest is dramatic. And just the, the story that Marlene bring about this uh, Danish uh, um, singer, what was singer his name again? Who Riley? Uh, Riley, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's uh, exactly a, 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 one of the explanation. Like. You have a new generation of people, especially in Europe, uh, Generation Z, who, are, who discovered Korea through YouTube, through the access to the internet over the last decade. And it's been building up, I think, for a decade under the radar. And now these people are becoming adult and, you know, they, they, they grew up with k-pop they grew up with the hallyu with the korean uh, drama and now uh, i'm entering these day people who are exactly coming here to visit korea because they heard bts because they watch a drama and it's becoming a new drive to discover this country so i think korea uh, there's this interest in, in the um, in the west of new generation not just the west also emerging countries it's like a global phenomenon and at the same time i mean seoul changed a lot improved a lot in terms of diversity over the last decade there's much more on offer because korean society as you know better than me always want to upgrade always want to compete always want to get the best so the quality of infrastructure the quality of the food scene and also the trend, you know how oh, it's important for Koreans to be trended and to have the latest trend. So there's always a, a drive to get the, the new things. So that's all these ingredients together makes a city like Seoul um, extremely fascinating for the outside audience because it's, you know, it's, it's something a bit exotic, but at the same time, you know, it's understandable. It, they're using some of the trends that are around the world, but they remake it in their own way. So I think for also international audience, it brings something a bit fresh, a bit new. Uh, and at the same time, it's not the Wild West uh, anymore. It's also a city that is very much uh, uh, upgraded now in terms of, of facilities and, and uh, a bit more people speak English. So I think there's all these things converging at the moment that makes Seoul as kind of one of these new frontiers where people want to go. And I'm impressed also by the so many requests I receive of people who are going in, asking me about Seoul, asking me about Korea, etc which I can tell what one, yeah, one decade ago, it was more like, where, where is uh, Korea? Is it north? Is it south? Where is right, Seoul? Right, I see. There have been changes, of course. Well, Lainey, Bloomberg touched upon the burden of childcare and mothers here in the country while also sharing the presence of online platforms that set up mothers with potential babysitters. Could you tell us a bit about that and how does the situation here in Korea perhaps compare to the situation in Denmark with regard to childcare? 
Yeah, so in Korea, it's uh, very hard for parents to, uh, to take time off work, to take care of their children. So uh, the Blooms, uh, Bloomsburg reported that even uh, mothers with sick children could not take time off work and had to like fight babysitters uh, while they were at working, calling and crying. Um, those kind of things, I just, I can't picture them happening I in Denmark. In Denmark, we're very generous for when kids uh, are sick, the parent will leave immediately. When, when the kid has to go to the dentist, the parent will also leave work. We're very generous in that aspect. Uh, another aspect is that we have um, parental leave, where it's, it's very easy to get a long time off when you have just become a parent for both men and for women. Um, so there is really a very big culture clash here where I think in Denmark we might not need those kind of like online um, apps as we see in Korea that the parents actually have to depend on online apps finding babysitters. Um, I, I, I can't really uh, see that the kind of future in Denmark where we also have a lot of kindergartens um, where it's very easy to put your child, very easy and affordable to put your child in a kindergarten as well. Um, as well as uh, working from home, has become um, very normal in Denmark. Uh, also more normal in Korea, but, but I think in Denmark it's, it's very easy to stay home for a day or for a few days if you need it. Um, so there is just a very, very di big difference um, right. where I, I can see that Korean parents are struggling um, a lot. Right, hopefully they will get more support in the future. Sebastian, a finance website also touched upon 16 most valuable Korean companies in the world. Could you tell us a bit about those companies? Well, I mean, there's, there's no surprise there. You can imagine they're the big table, the big uh, household brand, of course, Samsung and even the Kia. Are, I mean, these are the, the what well, they are the established name and they have been part of the history of, of, of uh, Korean uh, rise. Uh, but what is interesting is how these companies have been, they have the brand, but they have been able to venture into new uh, era, like new technology. So we're seeing electric vehicle for Hyundai, that's a really important uh, thing. Of course, semiconductor, these are the, this is one of the assets is this company have been capable to move from one one economic industrial wave, manufacturing wave to another one. So this is the key to 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 survive. But also there's new emerging uh, companies coming in like Coupon, who are also pushing and a uh, new unicorn. Um, who are trying to bring a, a new flesh to the to the. But still the biggest, you know, in history. If you if you accumulate your power, you keep at the top in that kind of uh, economic uh, ranking. Right. Melanie, let's end on a very light note. Uh, very quickly speaking, now, a new Korean uh, survival show, Netflix, is taking the world by storm, if I may say so. Many are comparing Physical 100, that's the name of the show, to the drama scri series Squid Game. Have you seen the show? Uh, I have only seen a little bit of the show. Um, but it's, of course, it's very interesting um, because it is this reality version of Squid Game um, where uh, real people are competing in real challenges. And I think this is, can be extra popular in Korea because there is this very big focus on uh, the looks and the body. And we see all of these uh, young people going to the gym a lot, having their dream body, um, taking uh, my, best, my best body photos and putting them on Instagram. Right, body profile pictures. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so I think this is a, a show that is very Korean to the core. Um, and since Korean uh, shows are just gaining so much popularity, I think the entire world right now is watching uh, what is Korean uh, television programs and series Showing doing. right now, yeah. right, I see. All right, Melanie, as always, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts thank today. You. And Sebastian, it was a pleasure having you here today. Thank you very much. Right, well, on that note, we say goodbye. We'll be back same time tomorrow, that is Tuesday, with a look at the ongoing relief efforts over in Turkey. Thank you for now.